There's a saying you may have heard. The saying says, don't toot your own horn. It means don't brag about yourself. It's one thing to say something about yourself. It's another for someone else to say something about you. But when the Lord says something about you, it's true. And the Bible says of this man named Caleb that we began looking at last week, that God said that he followed him with his whole heart. Today we're going to look at three things that this man Caleb did that God described in him as. Not just somebody that followed him with his own heart. And we look at the character of Caleb and who he was. And we get a model for how we might live if we're going to follow the Lord with our whole heart. Numbers chapter 14 Verse 24 is where we're going to look at. I want to ask you to join me in standing as we read this passage together. Numbers chapter 14, verse 24. Last week we were in the preceding chapter where uh, the spies went in, 12 went in, 10 came back with a negative report. But two men, Joshua and Caleb, says, let's trust the Lord. We can do it if the Lord gives us the land. And so now the people have rebelled, and that brings us to verse 24. God is speaking here, and he says, But my servant, Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land in, into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that we might have a different spirit like Caleb that we would be your servants following you with all of our heart. Help us, Lord, to believe in you, to trust in you, to follow you. For it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we think about what the Bible says about this man named Caleb. And in this particular passage, the first thing that we see is that God called Caleb his servant. And then that first word in verse 24, the word but, it's a word of contrast. We talked about last week. Last week it talked about how 10 came back and gave a discouraging report, but Caleb gave a completely different report. And in today's passage, as the people have now rebelled against God and decided they are not going to go into the promised land because the cities are too fortified, the people are too big, and there's too many of them, and they just can't take it. God has said that he's going to deal with all of them. He says, but, once again, Caleb is distinguished from everyone else because Caleb is different, different. The first thing that we see that was different about Caleb is he was a servant of the Lord. If we think about this for a moment, why would God call Caleb his servant, and what, what is it that makes someone a servant of the Lord? Well, a servant is one who serves. This may seem rather obvious when we're thinking about, about other people, but I think in just a moment, if we begin to reflect on ourselves, I believe we might see that some of us have either never understood this nor perhaps never embraced it, but a servant is one who serves. The Bible says about uh, another servant of God, this man named Daniel. Daniel, who uh, perhaps the most famous episode in his life is when he was cast into a lion's den. And the next morning when the king came to check on him, Daniel chapter 6 verse 20, it says that as he came near, that, that is the king, as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel, like Caleb, was a servant of God. And what defines a servant is that they, that they serve. They serve. I often hear people make comments that it reveals to me that they don't really understand this concept or maybe they understand it and they just don't like it I don't know but people often 
make comments that reveal that in their mindset, they are only thinking about God serving them instead of them serving God. They're only thinking about the church serving them and not them serving the church. And so I, I can think of times in my ministry that, that literally people have, have said to me going out the back door, they said, well, pastor, I didn't, I didn't get anything from being here today. And I wanted to say, well, we didn't get anything from you to be here today either. Yeah. The problem, the problem might be with you. Isn't it amazing how a group of people can be in the same room, singing the same songs, listening to the same sermon, and one can leave as sour as they entered, and another can have a, an encounter with the Holy God. We, as servants, are called to serve, and we serve the Lord and we serve the Lord often by serving other people this was the case of Caleb think about who he was the Bible says that he was he was a chief of his tribe Caleb was a man who at his life had risen to a place of of leadership there were 12 tribes in Israel and Caleb was a chief of the tribe of Judah. Judah, by the way, was at this time one of the largest of the tribes. Later, when the kingdom of Israel would split, Judah and Benjamin, a very small tribe, would make up an entire kingdom. And ten tribes would make up the north. So this, this great tribe of Judah, the tribe that Jesus would come from, Caleb had become a chief. And we look at other episodes in his life and we see that he, he was no dictator. He was no trust fund baby. Caleb had gotten there by earning the respect of the people. Caleb was a man who was a chief. He also served the people because he was a spy for Israel. We, we forget about this sometimes, that when he went in to spy out the land, he embarked on a dangerous mission behind enemy lines. In fact, the Bible would tell us later, as another group went in, that they barely escaped with their lives. Yet this man Caleb, he, he went in on behalf of his tribe to represent the tribe of Judah and to spy out the land. He said, what does that have to do with serving God? Well, we, we cannot separate our relationship with God from our relationship with people. We serve God in part through serving people. In, in fact, Jesus once said, he said, what you do even unto the least of these you've, you've done it unto me he speaks of even giving a cup of cold water or visiting the sick or those imprisoned and he said you did it to me not that Jesus was ever sick but that when we serve people in his name we serve him. Caleb was a servant of God. He also served through obedience. When Caleb was told to go and to bring back a report, he did. Twelve spies went in. Ten came back and said, there's no way we can take the land. Caleb didn't dispute how fortified the cities were, how many people there were, or how big they were. He just called the people to put their faith and trust in God. When Caleb was given a promise to possess the land, he believed God and tried to persuade the people. What is a servant? A servant is one who serves God. 
A servant is also someone who has a master. Jesus would say this about service in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He said, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus taught us this concept that, that a servant serves a master, and you can't have two. So we think about where Caleb was. Caleb could have let fear be his master. I believe we can honestly say that that's the case with ten spies. God told them he was going to give them the land. And God is so disappointed in their rebellion because they saw him perform signs and wonders to bring them out of Egypt. You know, God is calling us by, to live by faith, but he's not calling us to live by blind faith. He gives us reason why we should trust him. Reason. When uh, I was in the, uh, Israel with my mom, it was just the two of us. And I can't tell you how many times a random stranger came up to us and wanted to sell us a ride or sell us a, a secret entrance into some uh, place. And, and immediately they say, oh, you have nothing to worry about. Trust me. And no reason to trust a random stranger. But when God calls us to trust him, he gives us reason. And these people had seen God bring plagues upon Egypt. And not just bring plagues upon Egypt, but spare them from the plagues. The Passover that Israel would celebrate for years, they actually lived through it. They took the lamb and smeared the blood over their doorpost. And the next morning, they got up to see all their children healthy and well as they walked out the door and heard the wailing and the crying of the Egyptians who had all lost their firstborn. They went right up to the Red Sea with the Egyptian army hot on their trail. And they saw God part the waters so they could walk through on dry land. And as the Egyptians tried to follow, he brought the waters back together and drown the Egyptian army. They saw God provide over and over and over again. And yet when God said, I'm going to give you this land, 10 spies came back and said, it's not possible. It's not possible. The walls are too high. They have weapons that we don't have. There's too many of them. We can't take them. Let's turn around and go back to Egypt. They literally said, let's choose a leader. Meaning they were ready to reject Moses, who was determined to lead them into the promised land. They said, let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. In the midst of this, Caleb was obedient because Caleb did not let fear be his master. The Lord was his master. He served the Lord. As we look at the life of Caleb, it's not just a lesson in history for us. God is calling all of us to be servants. In fact, the pinnacle achievement of the Christian life is to be recognized as a servant of God. Jesus told a parable about a man who entrusted his servants and then later came back to see what they had done with what he had entrusted them with. And in that parable, Matthew 25, 21, he says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. As Jesus told that parable, the point of the parable was that our master has entrusted us with a little. And the goal of the Christian life is to one day hear God say to us, well done, good and faithful servant.
as God looked at the nation of Israel on that day, he described them as a rebellious people. He says, but my servant, Caleb, Jesus himself set an example for us to serve. In John 13, 14 and following, he says, this is after Jesus has washed the feet of his disciples. He said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. When Jesus washed their feet, it was not just about him washing their feet. He was teaching them that they ought to wash others' feet. And t today, we, we don't have any need of this. We don't, we don't walk around in a dry, arid climate in sandals. But we need to be served. And that's the point that Jesus was teaching us, that, that he did this in his example. He says, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So the Bible says about this man, Caleb, he was a servant of God. I hope that it's your heart's desire that if God were asked about you today, he would describe you as his servant. There's a second thing God said about this man, Caleb. In verse 24, it says, but my servant, Caleb, because he has a different spirit. God said Caleb had a different spirit. I don't think he meant a spirit versus flesh. I think he was talking about Caleb's attitude, Caleb's outlook, Caleb's determination, Caleb's personality, who he was. Caleb was different. Caleb was different from an entire generation. Caleb was not a product of his time. Caleb was a product of following the Lord. So he had a different spirit. In the midst of a generation of doubters, Caleb had faith. When everyone else said, we can't take the land, Caleb said, God will give it to us. Verses 8 and 9, this is what Caleb said as he was trying to convince the people not to rebel. He said, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. Give it to us. And that's exactly what God would do. Forty years later, after an entire generation was left to die off in the wilderness for their rebellion, he would literally give it to the people. When they went into Jericho, Jericho was this massive, heavily fortified city. And yet the Bible says that God told them to march around the city, blow the trumpet, send up the shout, and God caused the walls to fall. God gave them the city. And then lest anybody think otherwise, shortly thereafter, they went and spied out this little tiny village named Ai. They came back and they give a report and they said, they don't have any defenses, they don't have many people. Let's not waste our time sending everybody up there. We don't need to. Just send a little band, we'll wipe out Ai. And yet, a man named Achan had rebelled against the Lord and took spoils from Jericho. And so God calls them to be defeated by, by Ai. After taking this massive city, Jericho, they were, they were beaten by this little village, Ai. Because the people were not taking the land. God was giving it to them. Caleb, in the midst of a generation of doubters, he he believed and trusted in God. And so he says in verse 9, Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. The protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So Caleb, in the midst of a generation of doubters, he had faith. In the midst of a generation of complainers, Caleb knew that the Lord was good. Earlier in this chapter, in chapter 14, it says, And all the people of Israel grumbled 
against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. This, this entire generation of Israel, this would characterize the rest of their lives. They were people who constantly grumbled and complained because they doubted the character and nature of the Lord. And yet in the midst of this, Caleb knew that the Lord was good. If you base your understanding of who God is on circumstances, you'll find yourself up and down, up and down. We all have emotions, and we all have varying seasons of life. And Caleb, he looked beyond his circumstances. He looked beyond the size of the walls or the scope of the people. And he put his faith and his trust in the character of God. Caleb had a different spirit. In the midst of a generation of complainers, he knew the Lord is good. And in the midst of a generation of quitters, Caleb stayed the course. You know, Israel, we think about their lack of persistence. As God had brought them out of Egypt, they couldn't even wait for Moses to come back down from Mount Sinai before they had already made an idol to worship. And yet, Caleb, this, this courageous report is not just one mere isolated event in his life. This is not just one single high point in which he did what was right. Caleb, for all of his life, would follow the Lord. Forty years he would wander in the wilderness, bearing the consequences of everyone else's rebellion as they each one died off and God raised up another generation. And yet 40 years later, Caleb would still be believing and trusting in the promise of God. God said Caleb was his servant. He said he had a different spirit, but I want you to notice something else. He said, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, has followed me fully. Someone once said, a half truth is a whole lie. And there's a lot of truth in that. So I think about what God says about fully following him, wholehearted following the Lord. Half-hearted obedience is wholehearted rebellion. We don't have the option to choose which areas of life we will submit to God. Caleb, who followed every command as the Lord gave him, was a man who God said followed him with his whole heart. I think about my contrast, the first king of Israel, Saul. The Bible tells us about the time when Saul and Samuel would, Samuel was the, the prophet of God in Saul's day. It tells us about when Saul and Samuel would, would part ways because of Saul's lack of obedience. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 17, and Samuel, who is the Old Testament prophet, said, though you are little, he's speaking to Saul now, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they're consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of things, devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. 
God told him these people were in rebellion. He was going to be the instrument of his judgment. He said, you're to wipe them out. You're to take nothing. And he wiped them out, and they took everything that was good. And then when Samuel confronts him, Saul tries to make it spiritual. And he says, well, we only took the cattle so we could offer them to the Lord as sacrifice. We always have the ability to justify our sin and our rebellion if we so choose. And so it was with Saul that day. And Samuel said to him, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. And listen to the enormous consequences of Saul's sin on that day. It says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul was a man who half-heartedly followed the Lord. Because he half-heartedly followed. From the Lord's perspective, he was in complete rebellion. The Bible says about this man, Caleb, who was not like Saul, that he followed the Lord with his whole heart. His whole heart. It's important that, that we conduct ourselves in such a way that our character does not in any way detract from our witness. But beyond that aspect, it makes absolutely no difference what anyone else thinks about us. No different. People may think you're an absolutely extraordinary person. People may think that you are a fine and wonderful Christian. People may even think that you're following the Lord with your whole heart. But friend, the only thing that matters is what God thinks. I want to ask you today, would you just be honest with yourself? Today, would God say that you're his servant? That you had a different spirit from the generation in which you live? Would God say that you followed him with your whole heart? Well, if not, it's not too late for you. The Bible's filled with the lives of people who made terrible mistakes and yet repented and went on to seek God. David, who was king of Israel after Saul, committed adultery and murder. And yet the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. Not because of his sin, but because of his repentance. And so I'd ask you today to be honest with yourself before the Lord. It's his desire that we follow him and that we follow him wholeheartedly.